Ed, just thank you so much for being with thank us. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Let me, you've recently made a major change yes. in your life. Yes. You are now going to be taking the chair of the Billy Graham Distinguished Endowed Chair for Church Mission and Evangelism. And you also have been named as Executive Director of the Billy Graham Center for Evangelism at Wheaton College. That's a long business card. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. But what on earth does that mean? Well, it's a title. It's an office. It's a role. So I hold the, the Billy Graham chair there at Wheaton College and uh, the Billy Graham Center. So what we're desiring to do is really to rally global Christians to, uh, to missions, to evangelism, to church planting, to things that reach people for Jesus. Now... With this role at Wheaton, is is this a teaching role? Is this a research role? Is it a postgraduate role? What what, what will you actually be doing? Actually, all of the above. So it's it's um, I do some teaching. I head the evangelism leadership program. We'll be starting some new programs. Anticipate in the months and years to come. And so I teach in that program. I, I lead that program and teach in it. Write a lot. You know, people can follow at Christianity Today or books and speaking that sort of thing. You know, so basically my job is to, and really with the Billy Graham Center, we want to lead the conversation on evangelism, on church planning, on missions, and more. But ultimately, uh, I quit my job, moved to Chicago, spent the rest of my life pulling in the direction of people showing and sharing the love of Jesus in the midst of a broken and hurting world. How are you able to speak into situations here mm -hmm. when you are an American and you're going to be based there? Well, I don't know that I would speak into every situation, but I think ultimately the the Billy Graham Center and Wheaton College have a convening power that's kind of hard to uh, understand unless you see it. And people sort of, they see um, Wheaton College as Switzerland of evangelicalism, right? It's this place we can all get together, talk about some things, provoke one another love and good deeds, as the writer of Hebrews says. Uh, and so ultimately, that's, that's what we want to do. But our task, our desire is, is to basically uh, ring that bell loud, that, uh, that, that showing and sharing the love of Jesus is what we need as a focal point of our ministry and our mission. Absolutely. Um, in terms of British church planters, yeah. British evangelists, is, is there something that they can interact with themselves? Is yeah. this a place where they can go to do some studies? Or we, We're actually building a team of scholars. Uh, we call them Billy Graham Center Fellows, where people have best practices in thinking about how to reach people for Christ, global missions, and more. Um, we have an annual Amplify conference that we're now gathering together. People internationally as well are coming. Um, we're, we're doing, we'll be doing some events in Europe, I haven't been announced yet, but some events in Europe that help rally and kind of bring people together. You know, the UK and, and, and Europe and other places will indigenously lead as well. And so what we want to do is just, just help foster conversations about best practices across the pond, across the world. The States, oh, yeah. UK and Europe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we are very secular. Very. People say that where we are now, the States will be in probably five to eight to ten years time whatever depending i suppose on which area of the states it is yeah. as you reflect upon the mm -hmm. british scene mm -hmm. as you have opportunity to as you look at some of the data and, and the research what would be your observations about the scene into which we are working? yeah well i don't i don't know that i would agree that the u.s is following the trajectory of europe statistically because it's kind of an outlier um and much like ireland is an outlier religiously and so it's kind of an outlier um, and, you know, Europe has, there's a lot of blood been spilled on European soil about wars of a religion within self-identified Christian traditions. That's not the case in the, in the U.S. But secularism certainly is on the rise. But the percentage of people who are devout in the U.S. has remained relatively steady for decades now. So what's declining is people who are sort of nominally Christian. Now, in the UK, you have a much level, lower level of devout, self-identified Christians to start with. Yeah. And so, so there's some distinctions between the two, for sure. Um, but, but the US tracking seems more like Canada than maybe, than maybe like the UK or Australia, for that matter. But nevertheless, the, the one commonality is you're more secular, we're becoming more secular. And you too, I mean, and the, and the question is, some people are debating, has Britain's secularism bottomed out? But still, you have a great bleed off of nominal Christians, people who who are Christian because they're, they're, they're British. Yeah. Um, and that number is declining. In the US, it's declining about one. Uh, most A recent study said it was growing to 2% per year, but that's kind of an outlier. We don't know as one study. Many of us are, are greeting the death of nominalism yeah, as, I a, can see that. as a good thing. Yeah. Do you, you think that is a helpful? I, yeah, either, what I would say, it's a silver lining to a dark cloud. The death of nominal Christianity, that was sort of a cushion between, between devoutly religious people and a secular culture. So, so, for example, um, now you're facing legal situations here in the UK that you wouldn't face 50 years ago 
because the nominal Christians wouldn't stand for that. They're like, what do you mean you want to make Christians do this? So what happens is that now that nominal Christians have more secular values, they're actually not on the same side anymore. That's the, that's the downside. The silver lining is, as culture becomes more secular, what is and is not a Christian becomes more evident. Yeah. So, for example, is the crown the defender of the faith or defender of faith? Mm-hmm. Well, is the defender of faith? Okay, that's good. Then it's kind of a good generic idea and a term. So what Christian means becomes more clear. No, it's not faith. It's, it's the faith once delivered to the yeah. saints, Jude 3 yeah. says. Yeah. So, so ultimately, the clarity of what a Christian is and is not. Because one of the great challenges in the West is evangelizing people who think they're already Christians. But if we can just get to the place where, and there's some negatives to this, we're kind of like, are here are the Christians. This is what they look like. Here are the rest of the non-Christians, and then you evangelize more naturally because of that. So nominalism is a hindrance to evangelism, but it's also been a cushion against some of the challenges of culture that I think are coming our way. Sure. And the rise of the new atheism, would you see that as a direct response to this more binary division? Yeah. So all right. So in the, in the English-speaking world, new atheism is a huge publishing phenomenon. In the U.S., it's not a huge statistical phenomenon. It's a little higher here in the U.K. At this point, the new atheism is much more of a publishing phenomenon. And I think a lot of Christians buy in their books to see how to refute them than actually a cultural phenomenon. The biggest cultural phenomenon is just people, eh, I'm over it. Um, We've been talking about what uh, America can gain from the European experience. Let's flip that. What could we, as evangelicals in the UK, learn from America? Hmm, I always think that's a bad idea. Uh, I think I just, you know, again, Americans telling you what to do doesn't seem to end well. Again, my Canadian wife has taught me long ago that nobody wants to hear an American's opinion. Um, here, here's, here's what I would say. There might be some things that, that might be helpful. Um, I think a greater emphasis on global missions. Um, I think, I think uh, much of that came from the UK, was picked up by the US. But I think, again, that around the rest of the English-speaking Western world, a greater heart for global missions would be a good thing. Um, I think sharing that passion, uh, I think church planting yeah. has uh, really probably emerged in a greater ascendancy in the U.S., but now we're seeing, you know, even in planting missional churches, our new edition, uh, we use U.K. examples, Australian examples. I, I could have done that 50 years ago, but been harder, though. And so I think there's been a bit of a resurgence of interest in church planting in some contexts. Um, you know, so, so much of this is, I don't, I don't think it's from or to, I think ultimately it's learning from one another. So where the future is, is how are we going to evangelize secular people? And what does that look like? Because again, most of the nominal Christians are already thinking like secular people. But as they shed the label and shed the natural affinity towards Christianity, what does that look like? So we have to be, we have to walk and chew gum here at the same time. Uh, we need to evangelize the largest and most receptive group, people who call themselves Christians, but are not living according to that truth while engaging and preparing to engage more, those who are over it and kind of like, eh, and they're just secular people, they're none of the above. Secular people seem, certainly here in the UK, two things. There's loneliness, yeah. which is growing, yeah. and spirituality. Isn't that interesting, yeah. Um, what would your reflections be on how we can effectively reach, well, in one sense, I suppose, lonely people. Yeah. Reaching lonely people should be self-evident, though it probably isn't always the case, sadly, yeah. with our churches. Spiritual people. How do we reach spiritual people? You know, it is fascinating. Research shows that, for example, um, people in Iceland who are very sad, more secular than the UK, but have a remarkable, robust belief in what we would call fairy tales and things of that sort. It's fascinating. So what secular doesn't mean is that anti-spiritual. But instead, what secular means is perhaps anti-Christian, or maybe that seems too strong a word, anti-organized religion. And, and ironically, you can tell they haven't been to church in a while because it's not that organized. But they sort of see organized religion as an inappropriate expression of spirituality. And but I, So I think here in this, the opportunity is how do we take this where people still are interested in spiritual things? The vast majority of unchurched people still believe in God. The vast majority of unchurched people uh, actually are still open to spiritual things, open to spiritual conversations. So how, what do we do in that moment? Well, I think ultimately we see that as a bridge across which gospel proclamation can travel. Now, tying into your early part about loneliness, I think increasingly doing that in community is going to be key. You know, if, if the, I mean, the great history of British revivalism, it's a real thing, right? And globally, you know, we might say that Charles Finney and Billy Graham are bookends mm-hmm. of, uh, of great era of large and mass meetings that impacted here as well. So what's happened is, is that things have shifted to this idea of everyone come to a big meeting, 
to now where perhaps the most common way that people are having conversations about spirituality are in their living room. Uh, and, and I think that, that, that resources that sort of capitalize on that, okay, just give, give you a few examples, you know, and, and people will like some, not like others. But you look at like the Billy Graham My Hope campaign, which is basically, here's clips from the videos from the Crusades, have your friends over for tea, and then discuss them as a whole listening guide. 10 million, 10 million, tens of millions of people have participated. Alpha, tens of millions of people. But what they have in common is, is it's a safe place to talk about spiritual things that people aren't scared away by talking about spiritual things. So what I would say is, is those two things together point to the opportunity of really uh, inviting people into safe space, conversation around a living room, talking about what's a really dangerous thing, the good news of the gospel that changes everything, and recognizing that their interest in spiritual things may be the bridge across which the gospel travels. Yeah, amen to that. Let me ask a question again about the American scene, yeah. um, something that puzzles some of us. The racial divide that yeah. we see, the Black Lives Matter yeah. campaign. Now, we are seeing, again, in the UK, the fastest growing church are the Black majority churches, sure, sure, and sure. we rejoice sure. in that. And I don't think we necessarily see some of the tensions here that mm -hmm. America, America experiences. Is that purely an historical sociological phenomenon that we're seeing working its way out, or is there something unique going on here? Well, there certainly is. I mean, basically, um, I mean, we have a history that's quite different than many places. The large forced migration of, uh, of, of people from Africa who became slaves, what we call African-American des descendants of, yeah. of those slaves today, um, and, and, and a history of oppression and a history of marginalization that impact things. So, so what's happened in the, in the U.S. is, is in, now I shouldn't say it's, it's, it's not unique around the world that there are marginalized people who feel that they are not being appropriately uh, treated, uh, welcomed, you know, um, or, or unjustly or unfairly governed. Mm -hmm. So that, that exists. And I, we could give examples. UK would have examples yeah. of that as well. Yeah. But in, in this case, um, there's the Black Lives Matter movement, which again, I'm not African American. I don't, I don't feel uh, fully equipped to explain. But I've been, what, I, what, I've been trying, what I've been trying to do is I've been hosting a series of, of uh, blog posts, articles at Christianity Today, where I, where I write from, uh, African-American evangelical leaders. The basic is saying, you know, here's, here's why people are saying this. Yeah. And it's, it's important because the typical evangelical response, evangelicals in the States tend to be conservatives. Conservatives uh, tend to often be hesitant to um, jump, jump into such a cause. And, and the founders of the Black Lives Movement organization have some very, very radical ideas that would, that would yeah. repel a lot of Christians, yeah. and, and rightfully so. Um, but... Here's what, what my African-American um, evangelical leader friends tell me, is that, you know, what, what you say Black Lives Matter, people say all lives matter. And the response is Chris Brooks, who's uh, I co-host his, or I, not co -host, I, I substitute host his radio show at times. He's African-American on the Moody Radio Network. So, I mean, Moody, solid conservative evangelical. Yeah, yeah. What he, was, he compared, he says this, unborn lives matter. So when I say unborn lives matter, you don't say all lives matter. Because the only question here is do unborn lives matter? And there's a significant percentage of our population, uh, specific African-American percentage, who wonder if their lives matter. And so I'm, I'm quite glad to say Black Lives Matter. Yeah. You know, I don't have a difficulty. I don't affirm yeah. um, you know, the movement and the, and the governing document statements. I mean, that's a whole different thing. And yeah, you have to be cautious, say, because that gets in people's minds sort of connecting together. But there, there is systemic injustice. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. You know, I'm here in the UK on a day when a report related to uh, police violence in response to a strike is all over the news and people are upset about it and things of that sort. Um, so these things happen. These things happen everywhere and people debate and people think. So I come from a law enforcement family. So my natural human inclination is towards law enforcement. Um, I also know that my African-American friends are hurting and wondering if their lives matter. And I think in the way of Jesus, I want to grieve with those who grieve, not tell them they shouldn't be grieving. I want to hurt with those who hurt, not tell them they shouldn't be hurting. And ultimately, to say to African American sisters and brothers uh, in the U.S. Uh, that yeah, your your lives matter. I'm concerned about the systemic injustice that I see, and uh, in the way of Jesus, I want to I want to I want to both share with you the struggle and the journey. And in my case, because I happen to have something of a, of a platform among evangelicals, is to share my platform so you can tell your story. And they have, and I think in a nuanced and a helpful way. So. Excellent. And just as we maybe draw this to a close. To talk about you, um, sure. how, how do you manage work? 
Mm-hmm. How do you manage life? Church planters, those gospel workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We feel yeah. driven and passionate, but we also see people who hit burnout levels. Yeah. Uh, just give us some insight into how you operate, why you operate. Well, I think it's important that I am doing my job that God has called me to. Um, and I think people should do their jobs that God's called them to. And those are probably not going to look like what I do. So it can be impressive when people, you know, you sit down and we, let's say we talk about the UK and I, I can, you know, I, I know the history of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop of Canterbury, and I know kind of the weird journey HTB and all this sort of stuff. And, and so, yeah. okay, so, so, so a lot of people would say, what? That's pretty cool. He knows that. Yeah, but if I was pastoring a church, I, I would hope that I know my people like I know odd histories of this or that. Yeah. And so I think the distinction is, is my full-time job is the acquisition and dissemination of knowledge and information mm-hmm. about a very narrow niche, mm-hmm. church and how it relates to culture. I'm at the place now where everything I do, someone else preps me for, and I only do that which only I can uniquely do. I love, I love what I do, but I think ultimately you would be a poor church planter mm-hmm. and probably an irresponsible pastor to read 15 culture journals or whatever else it may be. Uh, and in a sense, I'm happy to do that. I love, I love doing that. But it makes me look smarter than I am because my full-time job is to gather and disseminate information. Whereas if that was your full-time job, people would say, how do you do it all too? Yeah. But that's how. Yeah. Last question. Your yeah. dissemination, a lot of it is through social media. Yeah. You use that yeah. heavily. Do you think that is the language that we should be increasingly using and developing? I think part of it's the niche that I'm in. You know, it's the, again, again, social media fits perfectly for someone who's pithy, yeah. kind of a smart aleck, um, uh, kind of quick, uh, and hope and thinks he has a good sense of humor. So it fits well for me. Yeah. Um, but what, and what I would say is, I think it can be helpful in pastoring and ministry. Most people who are watching this are going to be pastors. Um, yeah, so I would be engaged in social media, um, social media that relates and engages the people in my community. But I do think social media is a tool, but we not, ought not to lose sight of the goal. What my my goal in social media is to disseminate information and help people and serve people in that matter. Um, what's your goal as a pastor? It probably should be to encourage people, to nurture people, to, uh, to engage with people. So if there's something goes on in your town, you can hashtag along with that town. Uh, so I think there are good, healthy ways to do it. So I've written on it. People want to Google Ed Stetzer, pastor's social media. I've got, I've got five or six articles on how to do it, why to do it, but how to do it well. I don't think you should replicate me. You know, I'm tweeting links with stats and cultural trends. And, and the other thing, too, is I'm writing on politics and because that's part of my job as a cultural commentator. Uh, I, I, I would be... Uh, I would be, as a matter of fact, as an interim pastor, I have to be very careful. Like this Sunday, I said, listen, I'm going to write a lot on politics coming up this week. It's the week before the election in the U.S. I said, in this place, I'm going to open the Bible and preach. But I'm going to write some stuff online. And so I, but I think as a pastor, I'm an interim pastor. As a pastor, it's harder even to separate those yeah, two things. Yeah, yeah. So just be cautious, be wise, but engage, because that's a good place for people having conversations. And Ed, thousands upon thousands of us are really grateful to God you. for your gifting. And for what you're doing and the information you provide and the way you provoke and sharpen us. And may God continue to use you for many years to come. Bless Donna. Bless your girls richly in the future. But thank you. Thank you, brother.